The makers of Campbell Soups present The Campbell Playhouse, Orson Welles, producer. This is Orson Welles. Tonight, under the guidance of an expert, we're going to take an excursion into the underworld of the Prohibition period. Our story is The Glass Key, by an author who is best known as the creator of The Thin Man, Mr. Dashiell Hammett. The Glass Key is, to my way of thinking, one of Dash Hammett's very best. So sit back and let the Campbell Playhouse demonstrate that Mr. Hammett knows far more about underworld plots, political skullduggery, and crimes of violence than any other respectable author should. And then when our story is over, we'll have a chance to check on Dash Hammett, because we have with us in the studio tonight a man who knows more about this sort of thing than even Dashiell Hammett. Warden Laws, no less, of Sing Sing, of course, and who will speak to us at the end of this broadcast. And now first, a word from Ernest Chappell. There are different dishes that are special favorites with different families. But there's one dish that makes a big hit with most everyone, and that is chicken. People, by and large, like chicken so much that it's become the customary main dish for nearly any special party meal. I believe this enthusiastic taste for chicken accounts for the widespread liking for Campbell's chicken soup. Because as sure as you like chicken, you'll like this soup. There's chicken in the savory aroma from your plate and chicken in the tempting golden glisten of the slowly simmered broth. Chicken in the eating of this soup, too, deep down slow simmered chicken flavor and tender pieces of chicken meat along with the fluffy white rice. I want to make a bold statement, one you might have doubted five years ago and that perhaps some of you will doubt today. If you will eat a plate of Campbell's chicken soup tomorrow, I'm absolutely sure you'll say it's as fine as the finest chicken soup you ever tasted anywhere. Do you doubt that statement? Well, if you do, I'm sure it's because you haven't tasted Campbell's chicken soup recently. And in that case, I ask you to try it, because I'm sure one taste will convince you and that you'll want to have Campbell's chicken soup often. And now, The Glass Key, starring Orson Welles as Paul Madvik. My name's Ned Beaumont, and I guess I'm out of a job for a while. Well, I did the best I could for Paul Madvig, but there it is. A clean sweep for the reform ticket. (laughs) Funny how things change. Six weeks ago, you could have got four to one on the Madvig machine, putting over the whole ticket. When you come to think about it, there wasn't a thing Paul Madvig could have done differently. Not with the setup he had. I remember the first evening he talked to me about it in his office up over the party headquarters. Office? Well, it wasn't much of an office, just a desk with a lamp on it and a couple of chairs and a picture of the governor looking down at you. All right. Now, there you are, Ned. Hello, Paul. Lend me some money. What do you want? A couple of hundred. You've been shooting dice? Yeah. Here you are. Thanks. It's a long time since you've done any winning, isn't it, Ned? Oh, not so long. A month or six weeks. It's a long time to be losing. Why don't you try laying off a while when you hit one of these sour streaks? Ah, that's no good. It only spreads it out. Well, if you can stand the gaff. I can stand anything I've got to stand. Guess you can at that. Listen, Ned. You know more about this stuff than I do. Janet Henry's birthday's Thursday. What do you think I ought to give her? Is the senator throwing a party? Yeah. You invited? No, but I'm going there to dinner tomorrow night. Are you going to back the senator in this election, Paul? Yeah, I think I will. Why? Because with his help, we can put over the whole ticket just like nobody was running against us. Without you behind him, could the senator make the grade this time? Not a chance. Does he know that? He ought to know it better than anybody else. And if he didn't know it... You wouldn't be going there to dinner tomorrow night. Have you, uh... Promised him anything yet? Yeah, it's pretty well settled. Listen to me, Paul. 
Throw the senator down, sink him. Well, what gets into you in the head? Fine for just so long, they on you throw a fit. All right, forget it. Do you think he'll play ball with you after he's re-elected? I can handle the senator. Maybe, but don't forget he's never been licked at anything in his life. Sure, and that's one of the best reasons I know for throwing in with him. No, it isn't, Paul. It's the very worst. Think that over, even if it hurts your head. How far has this dizzy blonde daughter of his got her hooks into you? I'm going to marry Miss Henry. Is that part of the bargain? Nobody knows it yet, except you and me. That's what you want, make them put it in writing. Better still insist on the wedding before election day. Then you'll at least be sure of your pound of flesh, Paul, or uh, she'll weigh around 110, won't she? I don't know why you keep talking about the senator like he was a yake. He's a gentleman. Absolutely, and his daughter's an aristocrat. Of them, you're a lower form of animal life, and none of the rules apply. Ah, Ned, don't be sad. And we oughtn't to forget that her brother, Taylor Henry's an aristocrat, too, which is probably why you made your daughter stop playing around with him. Ah, no, Ned, that's different. And when you're married to Janet Henry, will that entitle her brother to begin playing around with Opal again? Over my dead body, it will. I didn't ask for all this. I just asked you what kind of present I ought to give Miss Henry. How far have you got with her? Nowhere. I've been... Well, I've been over there a half dozen times to talk to Senator. Sometimes I see her and sometimes I don't. But you didn't get a bid to the birthday party. No, not yet. Then the answer's one you won't like. Such as? Don't give her anything. Ah, oh, Nick. Well, do whatever you like. You ask me. But why? You're not supposed to give people things unless you're sure they'd like to get them from you. I got you. Guess you're right. I'll be hanged if I'll pass up the chance to give her a present. Well, flowers then, or something like that might be all right. Flowers? Yeah, Ned, but I want to... Sure, you wanted to give her a roadster or a couple of yards of pearls. You'll get your chance at that later. Start little and grow. Paul went to that dinner. It was the next night, a Wednesday. Just lately, I found out what happened up at the senator's house that evening. As a matter of fact, I got it... Oh, well, never mind. I don't give it a thought, Senator. Me behind you, the election's as good as in the bag. Yeah, I've been through a few more elections than you, Magic. They're never in the bag until the votes are counted. The boys will figure to pile up a 30,000 majority in the 8th Ward alone. What will you two talk about when the election's over? <laughs> How to win the next one, Miss Henry. I'm afraid that's true. Oh, if you'll excuse me, Madvig, I'll leave you alone with Janet for a moment. Sure, sir. I want to have a talk with my son before he goes out. I'll be right back. You'll uh, have to excuse my brother for not coming down to dinner. That's all right. Taylor and I had a little misunderstanding some weeks back about my daughter. You're not uh, interested in music, are you, Mr. Madvig? I'm interested in anything you do, Miss Henry. I didn't ask that. Music? Oh, yes, I like music. You play it? I can see you're a difficult man to amuse, <laughs> Mr. Madsey. The conversation must be about politics or about me. Is that it? Well, those are the two things I'm interested in. Do you think they go together very well? Yes, when one's a means to the other. Mr. Madsey. My friends call me poor. Very well. Paul, then. Listen, Miss Henry. I know this a little out of my line. I know I'm a politician from the wrong side of town and you're Senator Henry's daughter. About all I've ever learned that you don't get up to the sixth grade is how to run things. How to get other people to run things for you. Not quite all. I can learn music and the rest of the things on your side of the town. That's what I'm setting out to do. Janet, you're the end of my road. Everything I want. Everything I want to be. Mr. Madsen. Sorry. Thought you wanted me to kiss you. I think you'd better go now. I'll explain to Father. Sorry. Let's not talk about it. Your coat's in the hall. All right. Good night, Miss Henry. Good night, Mr. Madsen. Oh, what's that? Who just went out? Where's Paul? He's gone. 
I wanted to see him. Taylor promised to come down and apologize for, uh... Janet, why did Paul go? Because I asked him to. Father, is it really necessary for me to associate with Mr. Madbig? When you're in public life, my dear, besides, Paul's not a bad sort. He's the sort that wants something for everything he does. This evening, he started collecting. What do you mean, Janet? That's what I say. He started to make love to me. Catch that. Well, it must have been Taylor. I hope he didn't hear what I said. You know how he feels about Madvig. Taylor, come back here! Taylor, come back! Taylor! Taylor! I had an idea Paul would stop by party headquarters that night after the dinner, and I went up to his office and sat at his desk waiting for him. It was after ten when he came in. Hello, Ned. What are you doing at my desk? Oh, reading the paper. Thought you was downstairs playing dice. I was. How'd the Henry dinner go? I've been to worse. Was Taylor there? Not at dinner. Why? Because he's dead. In a gut up in China Street. With a fractured skull. Is that so? Do you understand what I said? Yes. Well? Well, what? He was killed. All right. Do you want me to get hysterical about it? Oh, I thought you might want to look into it since it's Senator Henry's son. It's up to the cops, isn't it? I was there with him before they moved the body. Did you notice anything? Yeah. What? His hat wasn't there. You won't need it now. Well, I'll be going along. So long, Paul. You're a fool, Ned. Yeah. One of us is. Next day, I drove out to Paul Madvig's house down on Mill Street Boulevard. I figured Paul wouldn't be in. Hey, Mrs. Matt. Oh, hello, Mom. So here you are at last, Ned. <laughs> You're a worthless boy to neglect an old woman like this. Oh, Ma, Matt, I'm a big boy now, and I got my work to look after. Uh, where's the kid? Opal? Yeah. She's laying down. She's not feeling good. Oh, what's the matter with her? Headache. Guess she's been dancing too much. Yeah. Uh, uh, father been up to see him? No, Paul hasn't been home since yesterday. Did they find out about the Henry boy? Did the cops ever find out anything? Is it all right if I pop in and say hello to Opal? Sure, go right up, Ned. She'll be glad to see you. Okay. I'll have a cup of tea for you when you come down. I went up the stairs and across the landing. The blind was down in Opal's room and I could see the light from her cigarette as she sat in bed. Hello, Ned. Hello, Snip. Yeah, I know, youngster. It's tough. No, oh, really, most of the headache's gone. So, Opal, I'm an outsider now, huh? I don't know what you mean, Ned. I mean Taylor Henry. Yeah, but... You know, I, I haven't seen him for months since Dad made me stop seeing him. Okay, kid, I'll be running along. Oh, wait, Ned. Back here. What makes you act like that? You oughtn't to lie to me. But, Ned... How long since you saw Taylor? You mean you talked to? It's been weeks. All right. Oh, Ned, don't make it so hard for me. Aren't we friends? Sure. But it's hard to remember it when we're lying to each other. Did... Did you know I'd been meeting? Well, I know it now. You... Never mind that. Ned, I... I was with him only yesterday afternoon... All afternoon, three hours before he was killed. Yeah? Who do you think could have killed him? You know, Ned? No. I've got to find out. I've got to. Why? Ned, if I ask you something, you won't get mad, will you? I'll try not to. Did Dad know that Taylor and I were still going together? Listen, kid, what are you trying to prove? Nothing. I thought you weren't going to get mad. I'm not. Did you really love Taylor Henry Snip, or was it uh, just because your I father... I really did love him, Ned. I'm pretty sure... I'm sure I loved him. Yeah. 
I drove back to town and stopped at the pay station and called up Paul Madvig at party headquarters. He wasn't there. Round three, I went over to the district attorney's office. District attorney's office? Mr. Farr is busy. Will you leave your number? Thank you. Hello, district attorney's office. Hello, sister. Hello, Mr. Beaumont. Tell Mr. Farr I want to see him. Sure. Hello, Mr. Farr. Uh, Mr. Beaumont's here. Yes, Mr. Farr. You can go right in, Mr. Beaumont. Thanks. You know the way. I ought to. District attorney's office. Sorry, Mr. Farr's busy. Would you leave your name? Oh, hello, Ned. Come right in. Hello, Farr. Sit down. What can I do for you? Farr, I want you to fix me up with some sort of paper, a special prosecutor or something. Oh, sure, I guess I can fix it up, but uh, what crime are you particularly interested in solving? A murder. The murder of Taylor Henry, remember? Oh, yes, but I thought... Well, that Paul Madvig and I might be interested in not solving the case, is that it? Well, now, Ned, I, I didn't say that, but... Here, I want to read you this note. I get one of them every day. Oh, writing notes, I think. Mean. Let's see. Typewritten on plain white paper? What does it say? Well, it doesn't say anything. It just asks a question. Is Paul Madvig the reason you're doing nothing to solve the Henry murder? Well? Well, now, Ned, don't think I'm taking that seriously. But, but you know, we, we get bails of that kind of stuff every time anything happens. I, uh, I just wanted to show it to you. Oh, that's all right, as long as you keep on feeling that way about it. I, uh, I don't think I'd say anything to Paul about the notes if I were you. He's got enough on his mind. Well, sure, whatever you say, Ned. Listen, Far, Paul hasn't anything to hide in the Henry murder, and I wouldn't like to think you were going around thinking he had. Oh, now, for heaven's sake, Ned, get me right. You know darn well there's nobody in the city any stronger for Paul and you than me. You know you can always count on me. Well, that's fine. Well, I've got to run along. So long, Far. <laughs> I never did spend much of my time at party headquarters and run election. I don't like listening to the same line of talk over and over again. It was Tuesday before I saw Paul Madvig again. Hello, Ned. Where you been the last few days? Oh, in different places. Oh, Paul, you oughtn't to wear silk socks with tweeds. No? I like the feel of silk. Well, then lay off the tweeds. Did you go to Taylor Henry's funeral yesterday? Yeah. Senator suggested it. How is the senator? He's all right. I spent most of this afternoon up there with him. His house? Yeah. Was the daughter there? Janet Henry was there. Hmm. Yeah, it's Janet now. Getting anywhere with her? Still think I'm going to marry her. Does she know yet that your intentions are honorable? I'll lay off and head. All right, Paul. I came here to tell you something you ought to know. About the election? Yes, in a way, it's about the election. Shadow Rory's noising it around that you know more about Taylor Henry's death than you're telling. That won't do you any good with the respectable citizens, the Civic Union, and the women's clubs. So Shadow Rory's shooting his mouth off, is he? Yep. His own backyard's getting too small for him. Ned, I think I'll knock Shadow Rory loose from our little city. I'm tired of having him around, Ned. I think I'll knock him loose right away, starting tonight. For instance? For instance, I think I'll have Far close up the doghouse and Paradise Gardens and every dive that we know Shad or any of his friends are interested in. I think I'll have Far smack him over in one long row, one after the other, this very same night. Maybe that'll keep Mr. Shad or Rory quiet. Maybe. But this wholesale stuff is too much like using a cyclone shot to blow off a safe door when you can get it off without any fuss by using a come along. I don't know a thing about opening safes, Ned, but I do know fighting. My kind, going in with both hands working. Never could learn to box. Only times I ever tried, I got licked. We'll give Mr. Shadow Rory the cyclone shot, beginning tonight. All right, men, break down the door. All right, boys, start working. 
Okay, that's all for here, boys. Paradise Gardens next. Quite a night. From midnight to dawn, they raided Shadow Rory's places. The doghouse, Paradise Garden, the carousel, one after another. The next evening, Paul Madvig and I were sitting in a private room at Pip Carson's. The man opened the door and came in without knocking. A man of medium height with smooth white hair. He wore a dark blue overcoat over a dark blue suit and carried a black derby hat and a black gloved hand. Are you, Shad? I'm fine, Paul. How's yourself? You know Beaumont? It's a Shad O'Rory. Yep. Yeah. Madwig, politics is politics and business is business. I've been paying my way and I'm willing to go on paying my way in this town. But I want what I'm paying for. Yeah? What do you mean by that? I mean that half the coppers in town are buying their cakes and ale with dough they're getting from me and some of my friends. Well... I want what I'm paying for. I'm paying to be let alone. In election or no election, I want to be let alone. Business is business and politics is politics. Let's keep them apart. No. It's going to mean killing. If you make it mean killing. It'll have to mean killing. I'm too big to take the boot from you, Madvig. Maybe you're too big to take it laying down, but you'll take it. You are taking it. I'm opening the Paradise Garden again tonight. I don't want to be bothered. Bother me and I'll bother you. Ned, get me headquarters on that phone, will you? Sure. Operator, police headquarters. Well, I want to speak to Lieutenant Brett. There he is, Paul. Hello, Brett. Paul Madwig. How are the folks? It's good. Say, Brett, I hear Shad's thinking of opening up again tonight. Yeah. Yeah, the paradise. We'll slam it down as hard as it can. Right. Sure. Bye. Now, do you know where you stand? You're through, Shad. You're through. I understand. So long, Maddie. Well? Wrong, Paul. Holy mackerel. Don't anything suit you? Say, where are you going? I'm leaving. I'm tired of Hicktown stuff. Meaning me? This is a swell time to be throwing me down. So you're hard to get on with, Ned. I never said I wasn't. Yeah, have a drink. There's no hurry, is there? No. Thanks. You mind telling me why you think I handle Shad wrong? It won't do any good. Try. Shad O'Rory's going to fight. You've got him in a corner. There's nothing you can do now but play the long shot. You're trying to reelect the whole city administration. Well, giving them a crime wave just before election isn't going to make them look any too efficient. And then there's this stuff that's being said about Taylor Henry's killing. Next thing you know, it'll be printed. You think I ought to lay down to shadow Rory? Well, I think you should have left him an outer line of retreat. You shouldn't have got him with his back to the wall. I don't know anything about your kind of fighting. He started it. All I know is when you got somebody cornered, you go in and finish him. That system's worked all right for me so far. Well, Paul, this is one time I think you've let yourself be outsmarted. First, you let the Henrys wheel you into backing the senator. There was your chance to go in and finish an enemy who was cornered. But that enemy happened to have a blonde daughter in social position and whatnot, so you... Cut it out, Ned. Well, I must be running along. Now, wait, Ned. Take your hand off me. Now, look here, Ned. Let go. Don't be a fool. You and I... I said to let go. I meant it. Crazy nut. I ought to knock the devil out of you. Ah, oh, come on, Ned. Let's finish our beers. <laughs> Thank you.
You are listening to the Campbell Playhouse presentation of The Glass Key, starring Orson Welles. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. This is Ernest Chappell, ladies and gentlemen, welcoming you back to the Campbell Playhouse. In just a moment, we will resume our presentation of Dashiell Hammett's The Glass Key, starring Orson Welles. Who killed Cock Robin? Who killed Taylor Henry? I think there's nothing quite like a good murder mystery, and Dashiell Hammett is my idea of a perfect companion, whether it's for a Friday evening by the radio or for good reading anytime. But there's a time and place for mystery like anything else. And one place you won't find any mystery is in the kitchens where Campbell soups are made. I visited those kitchens as recently as last week, and I know whereof I speak. There are no secrets there. You can watch for yourself each step in the making of fine soup. Among other things, I watched them make Campbell's chicken soup. And I know why it is that people who have never thought a canned chicken soup could be as good as homemade change their minds completely when they first taste Campbell's. Because Campbell's make chicken soup the way a good cook does at home. Indeed, it seems to me that Campbell's way is in some respects even better. For example, where chicken soup at home is often made from leftovers, Campbell's use all the good meat of the fine selected chickens. And what plump, splendid chickens they are, too. But the thing that amazes me most is the care with which each ingredient is prepared and cooked and the precision of the measuring and blending. Skill, precision, a lavish hand with the ingredients. These you see in the making of Campbell's chicken soup. But no mystery, no secrets. And if there's any doubt in your mind about how good a canned chicken soup can be, I do earnestly invite you to try Campbell's chicken soup. Now we resume our Campbell Playhouse presentation of The Glass Key, starring Orson Welles as Paul Madvik. <laughs> Well, you can't keep a thing like that quiet. By next morning, word had filtered through the grapevine that Paul Madvig and I had quarreled in the back room at Pip Carson's. At noon, one of Shadow Rory's boys by the name of Whiskey Saunders came to my apartment. He didn't stay very long. Around three, I wandered over to the Paradise Gardens, and in the private room of the joint they'd smashed up two nights before, Shadow Rory was waiting for me. Oh, I'm glad to see you, Beaumont. Drop your hat and coat anywhere. What do you want to see me about, Chad? I heard what happened after I left last night. I owe you something for trying to stop Paul from closing up my joints. You don't? I don't. No. I was with him then. What I told him was for his own good. I thought he was making a bad play. you will know it before he's through. Is it so that you and Paul have broken for good and all? I thought you knew it. I thought that's why you sent for me. I heard it, but that's not always the same thing. Uh, what were you thinking you might do now? There's a one-way ticket for New York in my pocket. And my clothes are packed. How long have you been here? Fifteen months. You and Paul have been close as a couple of fingers. Uh, how long? A year. You ought to know a lot of things about him. I do. Why did Paul Madwig bump off young Henry? Make your proposition. How does this hit you? After election, I'll take you to the finest gambling house this state's ever seen. Let you run it to suit yourself with all the protection you ever heard of. That's an if offer if you win. Don't you think we're going to win the election? You won't bet even money on it. You're not so hot to go in with me, are you, Beaumont? No, it wasn't any idea of mine. Uh, sit down. We can still talk, can't we? Sure. Listen, I'll give you ten grand in cash right now if you'll come in, and ten more on election night if we beat Paul, and I'll keep that house offer open for you to take or leave. You want me to rat on Paul Madvig, of course. I want you to go to the papers with a lowdown on everything you know about him being mixed up in the sewer contracts. The dirt on how he's running the city. I want you to tell the papers how he killed Taylor and why. Well, there's nothing in the sewer business now. He let his profits go to keep from raising a stink. All right. But there is something in the Taylor Henry business. Yeah, we might have him there. It'll be worth it for both of us. I'll have a reporter put the stuff in shape. You just give him the dope and let him write it. You can start off with the Taylor Henry thing. Maybe. Uh -huh. You mean we ought to start off first with the $10,000? Well, 
Well, there's something in that. Here. Ten grand. Cut him up. Thanks. Ah, the thanks go both ways. The, the reporter's out there now. Shall I call him? I ought to have a little time to straighten it out in my mind. I'll give it to him any way it comes to you. He'll put it in shape. Fine. We'll go over to my place now and get to work it, on it. It'll be better here. Well, if it's the money you're worried about, you can hang on until I've turned in the stuff. I'm not worried about anything. But you're in a tough spot, and if Paul gets the news, you'll come over to me, and I don't want to take any chances on having you knocked off. You'll have to take them. I'm going. No! Jeff! Whiskey! Yeah, yeah, boss. Come on in here, you two. Okay. I am afraid we'll have to persuade Beaumont to stay with us. Sure. Want us to get to work? And how about it, Beaumont? You coming across on Madwig? No. It's too bad. Well, boys, get going. Come on, Whiskey. Sure. <laughs> All right, boys. You can stay now. Go back and finish your game. Uh, uh. Raise your two bits, Whiskey. I'm staying in. How many cards, Jeff? Three. Two for me. Four bits. I'll fade. Oh, uh, just a second, gents. Now, Beaumont, I told you to stay away from that door, didn't I? Hey, careful, Jeff. You'll croak him. Oh, you can't croak, Beaumont. He's a tough baby. I've never seen a guy that liked being hit so much. Or that I liked hitting so much. Oh, well. I'll call you, Rusty. Barry Kings. My part. Three deuces. Yeah, deal, Rusty. Oh, hi, Shad. How's Beaumont? Uh, Jeff's been slapping him down for the fun of it. I don't want him killed, Jeff. Not yet. Uh, Beaumont. Yeah. He's pretty far gone, boss. This is Shadow Rory, Beaumont. Can you hear what I say? Yeah. Good. Now listen to what I tell you, Beaumont. You're going to give me the dope on Paul Madwig. No. Maybe you think you won't tell Beaumont, but you will. I'll have you worked on till you do. You understand me? I won't. I won't. Okay, Jeff. Get to work on him some more. I'll try the same thing again. Hey, you. <laughs> it ain't no good now. He's throwing another Joe. I don't remember much what happened after that. It was getting dark, and I found I was alone in the room. And I remember something about tearing a mattress apart with my nails and teeth and setting fire to it with my cigar lighter. The next thing I knew, I was at the emergency hospital. Paul was standing at the foot of my bed. Gosh. Glad to see you alive, Ned. Oh, Paul. How'd I get here? A copper found you crawling on all fours in the lawn of the Paradise Garden, leaving a trail of blood behind you. I think of funny things to do. Yeah. Did your nail shed? No use, Ned. Then lay it on Jeff and let him take the rap for assault. What good does that do us? Is Shad still squawking about the Taylor Henry murder? Chronicle's full of it. Other papers are taking it up. We're going to stop that. You're going to stay in bed and get well. That's what you're going to do. Look, Ned. I've got a visitor with me. She'd like to see you. She's waiting in the hall. It's kind of important to me. You mind if she comes in? Well, I guess not. Who is it? Janet Henry. Well, the senator's dead, huh? Well, send her in. She said she wants to see you alone. That all right? Sure. Take it easy, kid. Looks like I'll have to. So long, Paul. All right, Janet. 
That's feeling better. Come in. Have a nice visit, you two. Thanks, Paul. I wanted to come. You don't mind, do you? Well, I'm flattered. Sit down. No, you're not. You don't like me. Why? I think maybe I do. You don't. I know it. Well, you can't go by my manners. They're always pretty bad. You don't like me, and I want you to. Why? Because you're Paul's best friend. Uh, Paul has lots of friends. He's a politician. You're his best friend. He thinks so. What do you think? I think you are, or you wouldn't be here now. You wouldn't have gone through that for him. I wish you'd like me, if you can. Miss Henry, I'm kind of awkward when I'm around people like you who belong to another world altogether, society and rodo sections and all, and you mistake that for enmity, which it isn't at all. You're making fun of me. But I don't even mind that if you'll let me be your friend. Well, I might. Might be something new. I never had a senator's daughter for a friend. Next day, I had another visitor. About two in the afternoon, the nurse came in to see if I was sleeping. I wasn't. A basket of fruit for you, Mr. Beaumont. Who from? Here's the card. Well, open it, nurse. It just says, please, and it's signed Janet Henry. Oh, well, help yourself to the junk. Take enough so it looks as if I'd eaten it. <laughs> no wonder people beat you up. And um, there's a Mrs. Madvig here to see you. I'll tell her to come in and you stay out. It'll be a pleasure. <laughs> All right, Mrs. Madvig. Thank you. Ah. Hello, Ned. Come on over here, Mom. I'm, I'm going to kiss you. Oh, what foolishness. <laughs> well, you don't look so bad, nor yet so good. How do you feel, Ned? Oh, it's well, I'm only hanging around here on account of the nurses. <laughs> that wouldn't surprise me much, neither. Oh, Mom. Look here, Ned. You've got to tell me the truth. Paul didn't kill that whippersnapper Taylor Henry, did he? What makes you ask that? Opal, wasn't it? Wasn't it? Yes. Opal's got herself in a state over it. She's sure her father did it. What she got? Uh, evidence or intuition? She gets a note like this every day. Well, I'll bet she does. I've seen one of those before. Read it to me anyway. Are you really too stupid to know your father murdered your sweetheart? That's what it says. Well, everybody in town's had at least one of these notes. Ned, it isn't true, is it? Nope. I didn't think so. He's always been a good boy, but the Lord only knows what goes on in this politics. <laughs> You're a humdinger, Mom. Would you tell me if he had killed him? Nope. Then how do I know he didn't? Because if he had, I'd still say no. But then if you ask me if I'd tell you the truth if he had, I'd say yes. No, he didn't do it, Mom. It would be nice if somebody in town besides me thought he didn't do it, and it would be especially nice if that other one was his mother. While I was on my back in that hospital, I did some thinking. I didn't like the way things were going for Paul. Decided I'd better get out and do some looking around. The doctor said no. I said yes. District Attorney's office. Yes, I'll connect you. Hello, sister. Hello, Mr. Beaumont. How are you feeling? Fine. Tell Farr I'm here. Mr. Beaumont to see you, Mr. Farr. All right. I'm sorry, Mr. Beaumont. Mr. Farr has an important conference. If you don't mind, I'll see for myself. Mr. Beaumont, please. You're not supposed to go... How are you, Farr? Do I have to smash my way in to see you these days? Oh, Ned, was it you? I thought the girl said Mr. Barman. Come right in. Oh, no harm done. I... I got in. Anything new? Oh, no, nothing. Just the same old grind. How's the uh, electioneering going? Well, it could be better, but I guess we'll manage all right. What's the matter? Oh, this and that. Things always come up. Well, that's politics, I guess. Yeah. Anything I can do, or Paul, to help? No, I think not. This Henry killing the worst thing you're up against? Well, uh, there's a lot of feeling that we ought to have cleared up the murder before this and that Paul ought to have helped. That's one of the things, and maybe one of the biggest that'll count against us at election. Made any progress since I saw you last? 
No, not much. Listen, Fa. Paul's always glad to help the boys out of holes. Do you think it would help if he'd let himself be arrested and tried for the Henry murder? Well, it's not for me to tell Paul what to do. Yeah, there's a thought. And here's another one that goes with it. It's not for you to do much Paul wouldn't tell you to do, Mr. District Attorney. Ned. How did you happen to come to the house with Paul tonight? You didn't come to see me. Well, I came because Paul asked me to. I don't go to senators' houses usually. What's that you're playing, Miss Henry? Like it? Yeah. I want to talk to you, Ned, before Father and Paul get through with their business. Go ahead, talk, but don't stop playing. How's Opel? I haven't seen her since last week. Why? Isn't she in bed with a nervous breakdown? Oh, then. Didn't Paul tell you? Yes, he told me his daughter was in bed with a nervous breakdown. He told me that. I suppose that means she's locked up in the house. That's right. She got the foolish idea that her father had killed your brother. But why did she think that? Who doesn't? That's what I wanted to ask you, Mr. Belmont. Do people think that? Didn't you get any of the anonymous letters that have been going around? Yes, today. I wanted to oh, show it to you. Oh, don't bother. They, they all seem to be pretty much alike, and I've seen plenty of them. Is Paul actually in danger? If he loses the election, loses his hold on the city and state government, they'll electrocute him. But he's safe if he wins? Sure. Will he win? I think so. And then he'll... He'll not be in danger? No, he'll not be in danger. Too bad, isn't it? Go on, play. You may not want this to be overheard. You can put up with Paul for the sake of the political backing your father needs, but that has its limits. Last week, you decided Paul had killed your brother and was going to escape punishment, so you decided to do something about it, Miss Henry. That's splendid. Paul's daughter and his sweetheart both trying to steer him to the electric chair. He certainly has a lot of luck with women. Keep playing, I tell you, or I'll shout it. You sent those anonymous letters around. Certainly you did. I'm not good at lying. I know Paul killed Taylor. I wrote the letters. You hate Paul, don't you? Even if I proved to you that he didn't kill Taylor, you'd still hate him, wouldn't you? Yes, I think I should. That's it. You don't hate him because you think he killed your brother. You think he killed your brother because you hate him. No, now listen to me. I'll tell you what happened that night. Paul came to dinner, the first time we'd had him to dinner. Taylor wasn't at the dinner table, but he was up in his room. Yes, he, uh, he wouldn't eat with Paul because of the trouble he'd had about Opel. After dinner, Paul and I were alone for a little while in this room, and he suddenly put his arms around me and tried to kiss me. What happened then? I asked him to leave. And then? Father came down. He'd heard Paul going out. I told him what had happened. And then Taylor came down from his room. He must have heard what I said because he ran out the door after Paul. Father tried to stop him. I didn't see either of them until Father came to my room and told me Taylor had... had been killed. Well, what of it? What of it? How could I help knowing then that Taylor had run out after Paul and had caught up with him and had been killed by him? He was furious. Oh, no, and... no, that won't do. Paul wouldn't have to kill Taylor and he wouldn't have done it. Paul doesn't lose his head in a fight. I know that. I've seen Paul fight and I've fought with him. No, no, that won't do. I know. You're Paul's friend. It hurts. You're right about my being Paul's friend. Then this is useless. <laughs> I thought if I could show you the truth. But we needn't be enemies, need we? The part of you that's tricked Paul and is trying to trick him is my enemy. And the other part of me? It hasn't anything to do with that? You don't know that part, do you? Sure I do. That part was playing the piano just now. Drop you off to club, Ned? No, thanks, Paul. I think I'll go home. You don't know how good I feel that you and Janet hit it off this evening. I can get along with anybody if I have to. How's the election going, Paul? Is everything going along to suit you? Eh, we're not as well off as we were two weeks ago. You know that. That's right. And if Taylor Henry's killing isn't cleared up pronto, you won't have to worry about the campaign. You'll be sunk whoever wins. Yes, what do you mean by that, Ned? Everybody in town thinks you killed him. Yeah? Don't let that worry you. I've had things said about me before. <laughs> 
Is there anything you haven't been through, Madwick? Ever been given the electric cure? <laughs> I don't think I ever will. You're not very far from it right now, Paul. Ned. I'm not taking up your time with my nonsense. I'm listening to you. Never lost anything listening to you. Thank you, sir. Why do you suppose Fire's wiggling out from under and the rest of the boys? They figure you're licked. Everybody knows the police haven't tried to find Taylor's murder, and everybody thinks it's because you killed him. Far figures that's enough to lick you at the polls this time. We've been talking a lot about what other people figure, Ned. I'd to talk about what you figure. Figure I'm licked? I've told you. If Taylor Henry's murder isn't cleared up pronto, you're sunk. That's the whole thing. That's the only thing worth doing anything about. That won't do. Think up something else. Must be an out, Ned. Think. There isn't. That's the only way. You're going to take it whether you like it or not, or I'm going to take it for you. Ah, no. Lay off. Well, that's one thing I won't do for you, Paul. I killed him, Ned. It was an accident, Ned. He ran down the street after me when I left. Kane he picked up on his way out. He tried to hit me with a stick. I don't know how it happened, but... Pulling it away from him, I hit him on the head with it. Not hard, but he fell back and smashed his head on the curb. What happened to the stick? I took it away under my overcoat and burned it. What kind of a stick was it? A rough brown one. Heavy. And you had a clear self-defense plea. I know, but I didn't want that, Ned. I... I want Janet Henry more than I ever wanted anything in my life. What chance would I have then? even if it was an accident. You'd have more chance than you've got now. Janet Henry's always thought you killed her brother. She hates you. She's been trying to play you in an electric chair. She wrote all those anonymous letters to everybody. She's the one that turns your daughter against you. She was telling me this tonight, trying to turn me. She's not... That's enough. What is it, Ned? Do you want her yourself, or is it... Doesn't make any difference. Get you, heel. This is the kiss off. Whatever you say, Paul. Norman, 5823. Hello, I want to speak to Miss... Oh, oh, Janet. This is Ned. You mind if I come back? I've got some news, yes. Say, do you want the lowdown on what happened to your brother? Well, look among Taylor's walking sticks. That's right. See if any of them, his or your father's, are missing. Particularly a rough, heavy brown one. Yeah, that's right. Come in, Mr. Beaumont. What's happened? Tell me. I, uh, what'd you find out about the walking stick? It's upstairs in Father's closet, the heavy one you described. In fact, none of them are missing. Neither Taylor's nor Father's. But what about it? Ned, don't be so mysterious. Look here, Janet. Are you sure you want to go through with this thing? I want to go through with it more than I ever wanted to do anything in my life. <laughs> They're practically the same words Paul used, telling me how much he wanted you. Did you tell him about me? Yep. Call me a liar and kick me out of his car. Paul and I are washed up. I'm glad. I won't pretend I'm not. Did Paul say anything else? Yes. Well? He said that he killed your brother. Ned, I knew it. Then you'll go to the district attorney. You certainly want to be in at the kill, don't you? He was in at my brother's. Well, I hope you like it when you get it. Now, go ahead. Call your father. Father? Oh, father! Would you come in, please? Right away! Janet, just, just one more thing. You're sure about that cane? Of course I'm sure. I saw it just ten minutes ago. Good. That's all I need to know. Well, Janet, what is it? Oh, hello, Mr. Beaumont. Hello, Come back Mr. again. Father, I'm afraid we have some unpleasant news for you. Mr. Beaumont has just told me who killed Taylor. It was Paul Madvig. Madvig? Mr. Beaumont, what have you got to support that statement? What evidence? For one thing, his own confession. Madvig admitted that he killed my son? Yes. 
This is, this is incredible. An associate of mine killed my son? I can't believe it. Father, what are you going to do? Well, there's only one thing we can do. Tell Far to arrest Paul Madvig. Operator, get the district attorney's office. Senator, I, uh, I wouldn't do that if I were you. What do you mean, Beaumont? I'd hang up that receiver. I wouldn't talk to Far yet. You're not quite ready. You think that you can tell me what you did and expect me to do nothing when my son... Uh, hang up that receiver, Senator. Senator, I have a special authority from the district attorney. I've got it here in this pocket. If there's any arrest in this case, I'd like to do it myself. Then why didn't you arrest Madvig on the spot? Because he didn't kill your son. Ned. Well, you, you just said... That no, Paul sir. confessed, yes, but I didn't say I believed him. His story didn't hold together. Sit down, Senator, and you, Janet, I've got plenty to say to both of you. You better be quick about it, Bowman, before I pick up the phone. It won't work, Senator, because Paul's going to stop covering you up the minute he gets arrested. Now, what happened, Miss Henry, is something like this. When your brother heard about Paul that night, he ran after him, taking the stick with him and wearing a hat. Though that's not important. You wanted to be re-elected, Senator. You couldn't let your son get in a fight with a man you were counting on to put you over. So you had to stop your son at all costs, didn't you? This is nonsense. I will not have my daughter... Sure, it's nonsense. And you're bringing the stick that killed him back home is nonsense. And wearing his hat because you'd run out bareheaded after him is nonsense, too. But it's nonsense that'll nail you to the cross, Senator Henry. Let's have it quickly, Bowman. What is it you're trying to say? I can say it in four words, Senator. You killed your son. <laughs> Well, that's how the Reform Party got in. Here it is, right off the tape. A plurality of 227,000. That's Reform with a vengeance. After tonight, Paul and I are on the shelf. Even Shadow Rory is out of the picture. Two days ago, he was killed by one of his own henchmen at Paradise Gardens. Senator Henry's through with politics, too. He's indicted for manslaughter by his own confession, and he's winning trial. Paul Madvig's lying low for a while. <laughs> Never gives up that man. I said goodbye to him yesterday. We shook hands. There wasn't much we could say. Well, I still got my one-way ticket to New York, and tomorrow I'm going to use it. Oh, uh, I'm the sort that likes to travel alone, but, well, I... I guess the reform waves got me, too. There's another ticket in my pocket. I bought it last night. This one's for Janet Henry. This concludes the Campbell Playhouse presentation of The Glass Key by Dashiell Hammett. In just a moment, Orson Welles will return to the microphone. But first, a word from the makers of Campbell Soups. A little while ago, I spoke of the lavish emphasis on chicken in Campbell's chicken soup. Actually, all the good meat of fine government-certified chickens goes into its making. The broth bubbles slowly and softly in shining kettles until it takes on a golden glisten and the good flavor of chicken is rich in every drop. Pieces of chicken meat, cooked deliciously tender, go into the soup, too, along with snowy rice. Somewhere, sometime, you've probably tasted a chicken soup that you decided was the very last word. Well, with that chicken soup in mind, if you'll try Campbell's tomorrow, I'll promise you won't be disappointed. I'm sure you'll say Campbell's is as fine as the finest in your memory, and you'll be glad you can have it at any time and often. You'll like it for lunch, for supper... For family meals, whenever the idea of chicken soup sounds good. Why not put Campbell's chicken soup on tomorrow's shopping list and have it this very weekend? And now, here is Orson Welles. In a certain sense, the glass key is something more than a detective story. Someday, perhaps, historians will consult it as a social document, as an accurate, if depressing picture of almost any American city of the not-so-distant past. Dash Hammett, one of the period's greatest chroniclers, comes honestly by his knowledge of the dark ways of the underworld. Before he ever published a single story, long before he went to Hollywood to create this cinematic detective, he was himself a private investigator, a dick in the vernacular. I'm sure he wouldn't object to my telling you the story of his biggest case, the biggest case in the sense that he was hired to look for one of the biggest things you could imagine. It was a Ferris wheel. 
As a friend of Mr. Hammond, I should like to be able to report that he laid hands on the Ferris wheel and returned it to the owner, but he didn't. Nobody to this day knows what happened to the Ferris wheel. Perhaps it escaped to South America disguised as a roller coaster, a merry-go-round. However, Hammett, thwarted in his career of detection, turned eventually to literature, and I, for one, am heartily thankful. There are lots of detectives, but there's only one Dashiell Hammett. Now, I have the great pleasure in introducing to you our distinguished guest of the evening, Warden Laws of Sing Sing. Mr. Wells, I want to thank you for inviting me to one of the most realistic crime dramas I've witnessed. Shall I say in an unofficial capacity? Warden Laws, would you say that Mr. Hammett's story reflects the underworld of the Prohibition era only, or one that still persists today? Well, booze is gone, Mr. Wells, but crime persists. However, I believe the intimate tie-up of crime with politics is decidedly on the wane. Does that mean that we're catching up with the crime problem? We've been catching up with crime for over 4,000 years. Tablets dug up in the Near East of the trial and execution of a couple of protection racketeers who had been terrorizing the local merchants. The record shows that these gangsters had actually been paying off the mayor. This particular racket was busted in the year 2000 B.C. Well, that's not exactly tossing orchids to the crime crusaders the past 4,000 years. Don't misunderstand me, Mr. Wells. Police action against matured crime is necessary. But there is another front on which the fight must go on. We may fill our prisons to capacity and work the electric chair overtime. But crime will continue until we correct the conditions which produce it. That's the challenge you made in your recent book, Invisible Stripes. Supposing we accept your challenge, Warden Laws, what can the average citizen do about it? The average citizen is the only one who can do anything about it because crime is essentially a problem of youth. And the average citizen is directly responsible for the training of youth. And there are, are at least three million children throughout the country desperately in need of supervised leisure activities. Well, that brings the fight right into our own homes, doesn't it? And those, the basic factors involved in society's effort to eliminate crime. No, there is one thing more. In the 12 months of depression beginning in the late months of 1937... Sing Sing received the greatest number of genuine first offenders in its history, <coughs> victims of a tragic lack of opportunity. We must find places in our social and economic fabric for every young man and young woman. That, Mr. Wells, is the answer to the crime problem. Let's hope that it can be accomplished. It must be accomplished, Mr. Wells, if democracy is to reach its true fulfillment. Thank you, Warden Laws. <laughs> In tonight's Campbell Playhouse production of The Glass Key, Orson Welles played the part of Paul Madvik, Paul Stewart played Ned Beaumont, Ray Collins played Shadow Rory, and Myron McCormick the part of Senator Henry. Effie Palmer was Mrs. Madvik, Elsbeth Eric was Opal, and Elizabeth Morgan was the telephone operator. The role of Farr was played by Everett Sloan, that of Jeff by Howard Smith. Laura Baxter played Jeanette Henry, and Edgar Barrier the part of Rusty. Music for the Campbell Playhouse was arranged and conducted by Bernard Herman. And now, Mr. Wells, may we have a word, please, about next week's broadcast? Just a word. Next week, our story is about three brothers who left England to save a lady's honor and who wound up in Morocco as members of the most desperate band of men in the world, the Foreign Legion. Next week, Percival Christopher Wren's romance, Beaujest, is the story, and with us, Lawrence Olivia and Noah Berry. And so until next week, my sponsors, the makers of Campbell Soups, and all of us on the Campbell Playhouse remain obediently yours. The makers of Campbell Soups join Orson Welles in inviting you to be with us at the Campbell Playhouse again next Friday evening when Lawrence Olivier and Noah Beery will appear with him in Beau Geste. Meanwhile, if you have enjoyed tonight's Campbell Playhouse presentation, won't you tell your grocer so tomorrow when you order Campbell's chicken soup? This is Ernest Chappell saying thank you and good night. <laughs> Heard on 
on tonight's show, Manhattan Serenade and Metropolitan Nocturne by Louis Alder, also Alfred Newman Street Scene. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. (laughs) 